It's with great, great excitement that I introduce the next team of speakers. A few times in life you encounter a team of people that motivate you to be the best. Uh, this is one such team. This team is a potent combination of an occupational therapist, Catherine Chow, a speech language pathologist, Tanya Desai, and a clinical engineer, Leslie Mumford. Together they run our Infinity Communication Lab at Sunnyview Public School, a two-year pilot research project collaboratively funded by the Sunnyview Youth Involvement Foundation and Holland Blurry Kids Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. This is a living lab in every sense of the word, and they are here to tell us about the magic that they work. Good morning and welcome to our presentation about the Infinity Communication Access Lab. As you know, this is a two-year pilot project um, that was developed uh, in collaboration between the Toronto District School Board and Holland Bloorview. The main aim is to provide students with complex needs with a means of accessing communication. As Tom mentioned, our lab consists of myself, speech language pathologist, Leslie, our clinical engineer, and Catherine, our occupational therapist. So today what we hope to provide you is an overview of our project, which we'll illustrate with a case study, and then present our final results as well as future directions. So to begin, Sunnyview Public School is a segregated school within the Toronto District School Board and consists of approximately 120 students, all with a primary diagnosis of a physical disability. There are approximately six to eight students per classroom, and each classroom is staffed with a minimum of one teacher and one and a half educational assistants. So what we know about assistive technology is that it can improve participation, engagement, and independence for a student. However, what we do know is that abandonment remains very high, especially within the school setting. So what research is showing us is that there's a need for a multidisciplinary approach to providing and assessing students on how to uh, give our students appropriate access to communication. So our objectives for the first year is to apply a delivery protocol that's used to um, provide efficiency on the access pathway as well as to evaluate the pathways that we provide. What we really wanted to do was develop and implement a protocol for providing switches to our students um, and tailor this framework to each individual participant. We wanted to develop and implement a teacher training protocol as well as a training protocol towards the educational assistance at the school. What we wanted to do was to examine if and how appropriate providing different switches or access pathways could be paired with a training program that could impact a student's overall aspect um, in education, attaining goals, as well as their overall participation in other parts of the school. So in our study, we did have 11 participants, nine of which completed the complete protocol. We had nine teachers, 11 educational assistants, as well as 11 sets of parents and caregivers. So for our delivery protocol, all students underwent a nomination and cons uh, consent protocol. From that, we had the 11 students, um, and they all went through an initial assessment. At this time, we took a look at what type of switches or access our students were using, and this also gave us an opportunity to provide custom switches for our students. We also had teachers involved in our study. Um, they all underwent a similar initial assessment. What's important for you to see is that under phase one, students uh, underwent, phase, uh, underwent training. Um, that occurred within the lab, and then all training occurred during phase two within, this within the classroom. Same thing with the teachers. So all teachers were trained in the lab and after everything moved into the classroom. Parents were invited to three different workshops that also occurred simultaneously. So when we take a look at technology, what we really want to highlight is an access pathway. So what this means is, is a certain switch that a student can use to activate an environmental control to activate a communication device or activate a computer. When we take a look at the student protocol, what's important to see is that there's three different stages of training. So first we introduce the assistive technology or we introduce the switch. 
And that takes a look at the positioning, how the student is responding to the equipment, and if they're interested in the switch that we're providing. We then train motor movements. So we use a graduated guidance protocol where the student learns to activate and hold the, device, um, the switch, activate and let go, and then activate multiple times. Finally, there's the school skill acquisition phase, which is the one that takes place in the classroom. So the student then implements one switch or two switches, and they learn to use it meaningfully. So therefore, they're using it to activate a communication device. Teachers um, underwent the initial protocol where they were first assessed and then they were, a strategy was described to them. So in this case, strategies on how to incorporate communication in the classroom. These strategies were then demonstrated to the teachers and they had the opportunity to practice. After the practice, uh, they were able to use these strategies right within the classroom. We had three sets of outcome measures. So our pre-measure um, was taking a look at the technology, the school's, uh, the students functioning, as well as their communication. It's important to note that during pre and post measures, we implemented the technology, the functioning, um, and the communication uh, protocols. Uh, so now it's Catherine for our case study. So this is Jacob. He is 10 years old and he's been diagnosed with a rare central nervous system disorder. Uh, he is functionally nonverbal, but very reliably opens his mouth for yes and uh, vocalizes to indicate no. Um, he's incredibly bright and really very motivated to learn and socialize with his peers, but didn't have a re reliable means of communication. Um, he had been provided with a low-tech communication book by a school, school team and had also been involved with the PRISM Lab here at the Blurview Research Institute. With the PRISM Lab, a customized communication program called Jacob Speaks was provided to him. Um, this program runs off of an iPod and it auditorily scans through a series of prompts. When Jake hears the prompt he wishes to communicate, he hits a button with his cheek and the iPod says the full message at a louder volume. However, although Jake had all of this available to him, he wasn't uh, using it reliably. So this is just a quick video of Jake in September, and Jake's teacher is behind the camera with us, and basically all we're doing is waiting for Jake to use his iPod to call us over. wanting our attention, but at this time wasn't using his iPod to initiate. So for this program, we did decide to continue with uh, the current access pathways, that's the button activated by his switch, and also to continue with the iPod that the classroom team had provided. Um, we did make some changes to the technology in terms of improving the responsiveness of the switch. We also individualized the technology and updated and customized the vocabulary so that one, it was meaningful to Jake, and two, it was functional. So in the next few slides, we just wanted to briefly go over the delivery protocol as it relates to Jake specifically. Um, phase one occurred in the lab one-on-one -on -one for eight weeks, and we again, we focused on motor movement, timing, and scanning activities. So we saw Jake begin to use his switch much more independently. This graph shows the prompt required for Jake to activate the button. At week one, he required a direct verbal prompt approximately 80% of the time, and by week eight, he was doing so independently. We also saw a decrease in the effort and time required to activate the switch, as well as increase in intentional activations. At the same time as we were uh, working with Jake one-on-one, -on -one, his school team was provided strategies on how to promote communication and language development in the classroom. So a few of these strategies include modeling the use of the iPod for Jake, providing Jake with sufficient time to process information when um, giving him choices and asking him questions. We also reviewed the levels of prompting to encourage independent activations, and also looked at finding opportunities in his daily routine to promote communication skills. So once Jake was proficient using his switch and his iPod and the school team had been trained, we moved into the classroom and the focus here was really on meaningful um, activations of his iPod as well as looking at opportunities to incorporate the technology into curricular activities. So we saw Jake begin to initiate communication on his own as well as an increase in the number and variety of messages that he was selecting. 
We also worked with Jake's parents and caregivers three times throughout the year, and this was to review how to set up and troubleshoot the technology, how to update and customize vocabulary so it was appropriate for home use as well as for use in the community, and we also reviewed the same strategies that the school team was provided. Looking at results, um, when we look at how well the switch was, used, was working for Jake, or switch efficacy, specificity refers to accidental activations. So initially, when Jake was not trying to hit his switch, he was not hitting it 94% of the time. So in other words, he was only accidentally hitting his button 6% of the time. And this remained the same at final. He accidentally hit his button 4% of the time. But it is important to note that the initial high specificity score might be attributed to the fact that he wasn't really using his switch very often. So if he's not trying to hit a switch, he's not likely to hit it accidentally. Sensitivity refers to when Jake is trying to hit the switch, but the switch isn't being activated, either because the switch isn't responding to Jake, or Jake doesn't have the motor movement or strength to activate the button. So we saw this change from 69% of the time initially to Jake being able to get to a switch 93% of the time at the end of the year. We also asked Jake's teacher to rate his own cognitive and physical effort to use the switch, as well as his perception of Jake's cognitive and physical effort to use the switch. So we saw a decrease in Jake's cognitive effort, which might be attributed to familiarization with vocabulary and Jake having a better understanding of what to expect when he used his button. We also saw a decrease in the teacher's physical effort that might be attributed to the training we provided on how to set up and troubleshoot the technology. In terms of functioning, uh, the school function assessment looks at participation levels across a variety of school activities. So we saw an increase in overall participation and specifically an increase in three subdomains, computer use, functional communication, and task behavior completion. Changes in communication were looked at using goal attainment scaling as well as a communication matrix. So the goal attainment scaling is a seven level scale where negative two represents the student's current level. So in September, Jake was activating his iPod inconsistently to request attention from a familiar adult partner at school. Zero would be the expected achievement or program goal. Plus one is better than expected. Plus two is much better than expected. And plus three is much, much better than expected. And this is actually where Jake was at the end of the year. So Jake was spontaneously initiating a new action or activity using his iPod with unfamiliar adults. And finally, the communication matrix was completed with Jake's teacher. Here, blue squares represent mastered skills, yellow <coughs> squares represent emerging skills, and white squares represent skills that are not being used. We really want to emphasize that this doesn't mean Jake is not capable of these skills, simply that he's not demonstrating them at the time of assessment. So this is Jake's uh, communication matrix initially, and this is what his matrix looked like at uh, the end of the year. So you can see a significant increase in the number of mastered and emerging skills. And what is perhaps most important is that this occurs across all four domains of communication. So we just wanted to show you a quick clip of Jake communicating at the end of the year. Please listen to me. Something to say. So these are the prompts that he's hearing. I want a great big hug. Jacob, did you want a great big hug? <gasps> you do? Okay, here it comes, Jacob. Here it comes, here it comes. Bear hug, bear hug. Please listen to me. continues on and, and Jake had made great gains. We, we always knew and believed that Jake had the capacity and motivation to communicate. We simply had to, to provide him and people in, within his environment with the, the tools and the opportunity to do so. So I'm going to quickly pass it over to Leslie. Um, so we're just going to take you through a highlight of our overall results in the interest of time. But um, as you can see from our chart here, 
So we're, we had a good mix of students who were coming in. Some of them were coming in with existing technologies and some of them weren't. Some of them already had communication devices, some of them didn't. So we had um, a pretty broad base for starting with each of the students and we, and we kind of tailored our training program to wherever they were at. Um, in terms of the technology, um, this is just kind of depicts the prompting levels of all eight students who completed the program. So um, some of them were at a full physical level right at the beginning, but all were down um, to the independence level by the time the um, eight weeks were up. Um, in terms of our response effort, this is just the final results. So um, basically uh, the thing to take away from this scale is that no one, by the end of the study, no one was looking at an effort level above five. And in some of the initial cases, they were at seven and nine um, from the teacher's perception again, but um, they found it very difficult to um, to use technologies with the students or to communicate with the students depending on where they were starting at. Um, in terms of the SFA, um, this is initial and final for each of our students who completed the study. So you can see um, gains for most of them um, across the board. Some of them who are fairly high functioning to begin with, students four and seven, um, the gains are smaller, but they did, they did show some improvement. Um, similarly with the communication matrix, um, students four and seven didn't really see any significant change. Um, but the other students who completed the study, um, their overall um, levels of mastered and emerging skills had increased. So in terms of our future plans, um, we've started year two of our study. Um, we have uh, some changes proposed right now to um, initially start with the teacher training. So we're gonna start it in the classroom a little sooner. This will give Tanya more opportunity to troubleshoot with the teachers and work with the teachers on um, goals that they, they develop together. Um, so what they want to learn both for working with the student, but as well as for implementing in the rest of their classroom. Um, we've also made a slight change to our switch training protocol. We're keeping the one on one um, eight week um, sessions for training, but we've also added a two week um, sort of interval period because we did find that a lot of students went to communication devices, which we didn't necessarily anticipate at the beginning. So um, we wanted to have a little more one on one time with them to allow them to practice with that before bringing it into the classroom. Um, so we've added a two week period there and then six weeks in the classroom. Um, we've also changed some of our outcome measures to better, um, really better measure the things that we really wanna know. Um, and that's pretty much it. And we'd just like to acknowledge um, Sunnyview Youth Involvement Foundation and the Holland Bloorview Foundation um, for providing funding for the project and also the staff and therapists at Sunnyview School, um, in particular Dale Zimmerman who helps us out a lot.